Actually, maybe we'll do that later. When you're just by the window there. Okay. And it's funny, you know, the one thing about New York... What's that? Sirens. Oh, yeah. Sirens. Well, there's nothing better in the background to let people know that you're there, audibly. <laughs> it's true, yeah. That's a proof. <laughs> okay. So, Peter Rutledge Koch has been designing and printing limited edition books, portfolios, and ephemera since 1974. He has long been recognized as one of the most accomplished printers and typographic designers of his generation. His training, influences, and achievements place him in the lineage of San Francisco literary fine press printers. A 45-year retrospective opens at the Groyer Club. It has opened, and that's why we're together here in New York. Welcome yeah. to the Bibliophile. <laughs> why books for you? Well, I was raised in a private library. My great-grandfather had collected books on the Western expansion and the scientific exploration of the American frontier. He came from Denmark uh, as a young man, a young ed university-educated man and sort of budding scientist uh, to America and to the frontier and all the way up to where the buffalo roamed. And all the while he was collecting books and, and those books were handed down from generation to generation. And I was born in this house full of rare books. In the house was uh, my mother and my grandfather. I was raised by my grandfather on my father's side uh, after my father was killed in the war. Which uh, war? Uh, World War II. I was um, just a few months old and my mother was uh, raised me in, my, in her father-in-law's home. And her father-in-law, Ehlers Koch, uh, was writing his autobiography and a novel and various things after retiring from the United States Forest Service. Great grandfather had written articles and books, and my father was a would have been a photojournalist of probably of some amazing <laughs> things. He was quite an amazing man up until his, he was 30 when he died. And I lived in in a house full of books. My parents and my parents read to me. My my mother read to me. My all of my neighbors were children of university professors or, or what have you know, and I just grew up with books. And, and I was scholarly, studious, reading, and not very good at football. Yeah, not to put Montana down, but that sure doesn't sound like Montana to me. The most unusual Montana you can imagine. We lived in what were, was known as the safe haven. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the rest of Montana could come to Missoula, where I lived, and escape, you know, sort of the horrors of small-town rural America and its, uh, uh, you know, sort of head-in-the-sand attitude towards the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, Missoula was a sort of, uh, was, a, was a, and is a, a, a sort of a, a Shangri-La. And why is that? Well, it's, it, it's physically remote. I mean, you had to drive an entire day and a half to get to a city. That's a long drive, you know, and, and you had, that was when I was a child. Now you can get there in eight hours to Seattle. Okay. Denver was a, like a two-day drive. Uh, so Seattle was a day and a half. What, what makes it a Shangri-La, though? What, oh, what well, Shangri-La is utopia, right? Yeah, but what is it that makes it so special? Is it, there was well, a, for me, was there, there must have been a university there. I yes, think. I was going to say, for me, what was special about it was that it was a small green valley with three trout, major American trout streams running through it. A river runs through it, as, they, as is the cliche. There's uh, the snow-capped peaks that are right there, so we, we were trout fishing, skiing, books. I mean, all my neighbors were scholars. One of my neighbors whose house I lived in, literally lived in it, I mean, from the time I got up in the morning almost until I had to go home for meals, yeah. was Leslie Fiedler's house. And Leslie yeah. was, America, at the time, was America's most uh, infamous literary critic. Yeah, and, and I grew up amongst his six children, and uh, he was a book smuggler. And so if there was a banned book, uh, it would be prominently displayed on his coffee table, of course. And in the summers, when I wasn't hanging out around the Fiedler kids, uh, 
uh, I was hanging out with Norman McLean and his family, and Norman wrote a book called The River Runs Through It, which is an American classic, and I, I, he was my external neighbor. It was, it was just normal. So my normal life was amongst people uh, who came to be very famous and who were definitely very literate. That's just such good luck. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think of Buona Fortuna. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate, yeah. and I am fortunate. Still, I, f I find it interesting. You're you're uh, known uh, for your the beautiful books that you produce, the fine press books that you produce. And when I think of a, a, a fine press, a private press, I think of a very a very kind of independent, solitary figure. And yet, collaboration defines your career. Why is that? Well. I am not a polycrafter. I, I chose a single craft, and I would call that craft letterpress printing. And then the intellectual pursuits uh, that surround letterpress printing, typography, history of art, etc. In order for my books to achieve what I consider to be the, the vision that I have, it requires that I work with expert papermakers expert bookbinders, masters basically of their craft, and authors, because I'm not an author of my own books for the most part. Although you've written some poetry. Yeah. Yeah, you, you look at uh, typographic design and fine printing, and yet one book that you produced called Heraclitus opened the idea of publishing as an art practice. Can you expand on that? Well, the, the, the Heraclitus, the fragments of Heraclitus, first of all, a lot depends on how you're going to define a work of art. And for me, uh, a work of art is something that originates in an idea or in a dream that you have, uh, that the artist has. Yeah. And, and I, <laughs> in the case of the Heraclitus, I was asleep, dreaming, uh, that I was in a library that... I probably thought was the Library of Alexandria. It was a sandstone, dry, sandy environment that was open to the sky and it was f like a courtyard in Morocco. I'm very familiar with Morocco having lived there for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw this library in my dreams and, and I, in my dream, called for uh, the book On Nature, which it is said that Heraclitus wrote. And it was important for me as a book because I uh, had studied the history of philosophy and I was much influenced by uh, a professor who brought to me Heraclitus as, as one of the quintessential uh, poet writers of, 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 of the 4th century BC. And so I called for the book in my dream. The, dream, the book arrived and of course it was such a shock to my system that I woke up. Mm. And I, but I saw the book and so the origin of my, my Heraclitus is, was a, a, an idea or an ideal that I created after having seen it in my dream. And so the, the binding and the covering material and the way that the thing is presented and the fact that it's in Greek as well as in translation, uh, by, I, it was all uh, just, I don't know, I, I guess I, I thought I think of it as a work of art and not a book. Well, because you translated your dream into reality. Yeah, that's your definition of art. Yeah, it's one of my. It's one way in which I go. Okay, because uh, I I was concerned that you might be going the uh, book artist route, which i which is sort of is counter to the traditional bookmaker route. Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, well, being as submerged or fascinated by the history of the book and the history of typography, I, I just don't feel the need to go outside the limits. I, I, I think the limits that have been imposed upon me make it better for me to work. Uh, to work. I mean, one of my ideal books is, is uh, you know, was printed in the, in, in the late 15th century. My, although another one of my ideal books was printed or made in, um, in the 1930s. That's the Hamlet kind of. Well, I love the Hamlet, but no, but actually I was thinking of something so radically different. I was thinking of uh, 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 um, 
Parole and Libertà, uh, the collaboration between uh, Marinetti and, and, and Alba Soli, the metal book, uh, the metal book of, uh, of futurism. And oh my God, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that work, that's a work of art that is absolutely transcendental. <laughs> and uh, I feel the same way about the Chronic Hamlet yeah. and the Hypnoronomachia Polyphily. I, I, I just, they're all part of one grand tradition. It's interesting, your, uh, your quote, master work, Point uh, Lobos, mm -hmm. uh, I know that was uh, published in 1987. It really is uh, a collaboration between you and a photographer and a poet. You didn't call that your masterwork, did you? No, that was, that was William Everson, uh, the great American, what I considered one of the greatest American handpress printers of all time. Yeah. Uh, Everson considered it a masterpiece. And, and, and that meant to him, you know, not that it, was, it transcended all other works, it meant to him that I had achieved mastery. Well, spe specifically, uh, you wanted to find a typeface that reflected Jeff Jeffers's bold, tragic voice, mm -hmm. yeah. and a format that uh, reflected uh, the photographer Wolf's Wolf's Wolf uh, Van den Busche. Busche's dark, brooding photos. Mm -hmm. So uh, evidently, you succeeded in that. I thought I had. I mean, I, I definitely had to look at all of the previous typographic and, and uh, structural achievements of printers before me who had treated with Robinson Jeffers. Yeah. And there were great ones. I mean, there were uh, uh, William Everson himself, who uh -huh. did some of the greatest work on Jeffers ever done and before. Ward Ritchie, the, okay. the magnificent printer in Los Angeles. Uh, I had to not tread on their toes. And so uh, it was agonizing, but I found this magnificent typeface called by Pe Pegasus. Pegasus by uh, Volpe. V uh, yeah, Volpe. And, and He's the Volpe from Faber and Faber, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah I, well, anyway, Volpe's Pegasus type had a kind of thorniness to it mm -hmm. that related to certain photographs that Wolf had that I chose. And I chose the poems and I chose the photographs. And Wolf, being the great photographer that he was, I chose them for their thorny, <laughs> bristly, briar patchy character. Jeffers himself was that kind of a man, and his, his uh, uh, what has come to be called inhumanism, his inhumanism appealed to me enormously because it, 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 it satisfied a uh, a certain requirement that I have with my poets, and that's that they uh, have a philosophical bent and that they're legible. I, I, legible in the sense that you can, they're, they're meaningful. I mean, the meaning is, a, is, is apparent. Yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, it's not too abstract. And, yeah, yeah. It's not too personal. It's uh, meaningful and you can understand it. Yeah, yeah. Being a reader and a listener. You said that one of the greatest joys as a publisher for you is to bring together an artist and a writer. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. is that? Well, if they are actually working together, they form bonds and friendships. I mean, I think. So you like being a matchmaker? Yeah, I like that. I do. I do. I like that. I, because uh, I cherish my friends, and I'm almost always working with prior friends. And if they're not prior friends, then they're becoming friends, friends in progress. So you like making their lives better? Yeah, yeah, of course. And that is a great way to make someone's life better, is to put someone really interesting and... In yeah, yeah, the, the, the collaborations are, are, are marvelous, and, and, and I mean that marvelous word in the more surrealistic sense, that collaborations bring things out that would not have been discovered otherwise, perhaps, if they're fortunate. Speaking of uh, his friends and, and mentors, you're connected with the San Francisco, California, what, you call that a school? Yeah, absolutely. What is that school? Well, the San Francisco school is largely the, um, well, it begins with this 
tremendous printing story, uh, you know, of, of John Henry Nash and uh, Taylor Nash, and then after that, the Grabhorns. And these were all uh, magnificent printers in their own right. Uh, Taylor and Taylor were more commercial, but they were commercial at the absolute highest end. I mean, you would say that they were designer printer establishment, and, and these people didn't work with graphic designers. They were graphic designers, and they and they were literary. Uh, often, uh, you know, uh, John Henry Nash would print the Silverado Squad or Squatters by Robert Louis Stevenson, or the Nash Bible or the Nash Dante, and uh, the Grabhorns, of course, published. Henry Miller. Uh, they published uh, or worked with uh, Ambrose Bierce and George Sterling and God knows who, you know, I mean, just literary printers. And then Andrew Hoyam came along and uh, being a bit older and, and pre, you know, before my time in San Francisco, he was uh, already an established printer. Yeah. So there is a, a San Francisco tradition. And larger than that, people will lump in a California tradition mm -hmm. and, and throw in this Southern California printers. I felt much closer to the San Francisco tradition because I, when I arrived, uh, some of them were still alive. People like William Everson was someone I met and, and had long conversations with and, and considered a, a close personal sort of mentor. And then, and then Adrian Wilson, who I worked with, and he formally uh, uh, hired me as his apprentice and when I was uh, 35 years old and uh, new to San Francisco as a printer. So I, I just fit right in. What's the most important lesson he taught you? Well, Adrian, I think Adrian, he, the most important lesson he taught me was, was, was Adrian Wilson. <laughs> uh, he was a magnificent man. He knew how to live. So what does that mean, he knew how to live? He had a heart condition. Okay. And he knew that his days were numbered. Right. And so every minute of his life was something uh, to cherish. And to work with him uh, was, was a joy. He, he, he would hand me a, an eraser and a pencil and sit me down at a, a, you know, at a drafting table and say, all right, here's what you're going to do. And I'd never had a pencil and eraser in, in my hand before at a drafting table. Right. And pretty soon I was design, making book designs for him for a book that he had been commissioned. And he that doesn't explain uh, how he lives life. Oh, well, okay, no, you're right, it doesn't. Well, he, in the evening he would play jazz at the, at the local uh, bistro, the wash bag, it's called, the Washington Square Bar and Grill. He, uh, his friends were, were, were the bon vivants of San Francisco's uh, artistic, theatrical elite. Uh, he, he, he printed for theater, his, his wife was an actress and an author, he was a, a well-known scholar of printing and, 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 and in his house I would meet uh, Hermann Zopf and um, John Dreyfus from England and th these people were constant guests and, and I was living, not living at night with him but all day long with him as a formerly as an apprentice. I mean you drive across San Francisco with a man like that and you take your time. And you, and you know the back roads, and you're relaxed. And I'm a country boy, so to speak, uh, you know, and I would drive across San Francisco, and I would drive like a demon. Right. But then I saw how Adrian handled it, and I thought, you'll live longer. If you so goes. what did he do when he drove across San Francisco then? Well, I just remember, you know, his house was on Telegraph Hill, and we were always going south of Market to see... Uh, that, which means you left Telegraph Hill and you climbed Russian Hill and uh, then you s switched over to another hill and then down to the bottom of that hill and you're down in the mission and that that was a, a tortuous route he, 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 he would you know follow the cable cars and zoom off into alleys that I didn't know about and all the time you know sort of humming to himself some jazz riff and uh, then we would land in the doorstep of some a magnificent printer, uh, offset printer, and uh, where he was, design, you know, he was producing a book, and, and and lunch would ensue, and and I mean, he just lived the life of a of a raconteur and a and a, a bon vivant. So he was able to make friends easily then, or a lot of people were attracted to his personality. Yeah, uh, Adrian was loved. Okay, loved. He was a fine gentleman, yeah. scholar. And unpretentious, you know, Quaker stock, himself not religious. And he was just everything I liked. Okay. <laughs> what about a bit on uh, 
uh, Jack uh, Stoffiger. Oh yeah, Jack. Well, Jack Stoffiger was was the other twin. It was sort of oh, there's Adrian and there's Jack, and they both lived on Telegraph Hill. Yeah. And one and you know Adrian was at Tuscany Alley, and Jack was at 300 Broadway, and you could walk from one place to the other in just a matter of I don't know 15, 10, 10 15 minutes, and <clears throat> Jack was very different than Adrian. Jack was crusty, uh, smart, well, smart, but I mean, they're both smart men, but uh, Jack's smartness was a, a part of his badge. You know, he wore it, uh, you know, he was an intellectual. And, uh, he wanted to show that he was smart? Yeah, yeah, he, he, he you know, his conversation was peppered with uh, not only current political traumas that he was experiencing, meaning, you know, looking at the media and being disgusted, and, but also with the, with the thinkers that, that who he thought were important. I mean, we're, we're, you know, whether it was a, um, a guru of, uh, of um, liberalism at, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, a, a Neoplatonist that he knew whose name escapes me, he would come up in conversation. He, he, he spoke a lot of uh, Italian printers like Tolone and uh, his respect for these uh, men of, of men of the of metal he called them metal men right. uh, yeah. what, and what's he best known for well, I suppose Jack is best known for being uh, the, the creator of, uh, uh, of the Phaedrus his his uh, dialogues with um, the Plato's dialogue Phaedrus, which he designed, mm-hmm. and, and so he was a book designer primarily. Yeah, that's what he did as a living. As yeah. a, he was a book designer. He designed exhibition catalogs for the local uh, museums, okay. Stanford University. He also taught, but all of us were teachers in a sense, and none of us made enough money at it. We felt that teaching was important, but you know, the, the, the we weren't of the professoriate, and so... You were practitioners. Yeah, we were occasional teachers. And what about, what about uh, William Everson again? What, what's he best known and remembered for? Well, Everson is best remembered for his granite and cypress, I guess. Uh, the, the collaboration, not collaboration, the book that he made uh, of, of poems by uh, Robinson Jeffers in a monumental format. Uh, you know, uh, using granite chips that he had mined from the seacoast in front of Jeffers Home and yeah. cypress wood that had been logged and planed, you know, in the neighborhood on Point Lo- of Point Lobos. But also he was renowned for his work on the, uh, uh, the Psalter, mm-hmm. which was a hand press work, absolutely magnificent. If you look at the Psalter with the eye of a I don't know, what would you call it, and an, a printing inspector. Aficionado. More than that, an inspector. You're looking for a flaw if you can right. just find one. <laughs> you know, oh, you just can't find it. Right. Yeah, it's amazing, the perfection that he carried into that, or away from that. Oh. So what do you mean by perfection then? Is it like what? what? What makes it perfect then? What does it not do? Well, what it doesn't do is it, it, it is uh, there are no printing errors. Like what? Uh, well, no, no over inking, no imperfect impression, no unevenness of impression. The inking was absolutely perfect. The type was so suitable for what he was doing. The the, the Gaudi uh, Bible type it's known as that he was working with in the Psalter. My God, that's a beautiful typeface. Everything uh, about it was. Uh, uh, so well chosen, and what survived is perfection. Right. Maybe he had to destroy a lot of mistakes, but what survives is perfection. And I suppose that's what every fine press, letterpress printer strives for? Yeah, I think so, yeah. By using the hand press, there's a level of imperfection built in, which of course is divine. Well, each copy is unique. Yeah. What about your collaboration with Richard uh, Wagoner? Oh, well, well, that was a wonderful experience, uh, meeting him and discovering him, and as I thought, as I did. I mean, of course, I discovered him, meaning that he was new to me. He specializes in uh, engraving, so wood cuts. And right, he, he, yeah, that's right. He, and I met him because he, he had taught a, a class in wood engraving that uh, a dear friend of mine had 
taken. And then I, I went to pick her up at the last class uh, to take her out to dinner or something. And uh, there was Richard Wagner with, with a bunch of prints in front of him that he was showing the class his work at the end of the class. And I was overwhelmed. Uh, I, I'd never seen such magnificent work before, fine, detailed, brilliant work. I, mm. And I thought, how can anyone be this good? And they had escaped my, my, you know, my eye. And, and it turned out it was because he'd never done a book. And also he was from Southern California, and, and, and I didn't inhabit galleries in Southern California. I'd never run across him. So I asked him if he had ever done a book, and he said no. And I said, well, would you like to? And he said, well, yes. And so I don't remember who suggested it, but I think it might have been me. I said, well, what about an ABC Darien? And uh, he turned it into a, a bestiary, sort of, ABC Darien at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and the work was just terrific. Uh, the, it was a long and very complex collaboration. The printing was enormously difficult. It, it exceeded my ability. Uh, I didn't have the patience to print the engravings. I, I, uh, I, tr I printed several of the engravings in the book, but after printing the third one, uh, I broke the fourth. Oh my God, I broke it. Mm -hmm. and, and so he had to re-engrave it. And if you're familiar with his work, you know that that's not a, uh, a time-consuming project. So why was it too difficult for you? Because the line, it was too difficult because the fineness of line and detail was so fine. And then the dense blacks that would surround and be included in this fine detail were so dense and so... Uh, so that, that, to, that to get an evenness of inking yeah. and, and definition uh, of black against white that was perfect, which is what we strove for, it, it took hours of patient make ready, and I mean hours per engraving. And I didn't have the patience or the skills to do that. And I mean skill, because the, he would look at the image, he would see that what was wrong, he would cut a piece of tissue, and, and, and then we would print it, and then cut another piece of tissue and we would prove it, and then cut another piece of tissue. And pretty soon these make readies were uh, uh, you know, like castles in the air. There were uh, as many as 50 different snippets. And, and, and he could cut that snippet and it would be just perfect and it would fit exactly. And I couldn't do that. I didn't have the, the hand uh, of the engraver. So Richard himself had to come and print his own engravings in my studio because he didn't have a press. So he would come to my studio every day and, and print engraving. You have 26 of these magnificent things, as well as the 26 initial blocks. So there was 50-some blocks. So he's not just a great engraver, he's a great printer. Oh, absolutely. I mean, his patience is beyond belief. Yes, he's a tremendous printer. Yeah, you say that uh, woodcuts and wood engravings uh, are the definitive materials for illustrating the typographic book. So why, yeah. why is that? Well, uh, they're made the same way. Right. Right. <laughs> they, they're defined by the same line, linear structure. They, they, they fit together like, well, like the classic prescription, right, the, of the, what a good typographer printer does, uh, you know, which is match the color and the density of the engraving to the color and density of the type. And yeah. it's possible. You can't take a photograph and do that except in the most rare of situations. We can be done. I mean, Van den Bush's photograph, or I've had people look at Wolfie's prints and think that they are looking at wood engravings from a distance, I mean, from halfway across the room. They think, oh, I'm going to look at a wood engraving, and they get up close, oh my God, that's a photograph. But then Wolf would push the density of his color, he would push the blacks and whites and the contrast in, in his, uh, you know, darkroom work. He was a master craftsman, too. Your uh, Ur text was a statement on the devaluation and loss of faith that you experienced in words. Mm -hmm. Because basically it's just the word words repeated across the page. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when I looked at it, I saw swords, not words. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't start off with swords. No, I started I off with words yeah, yeah. and saw swords. So what, what statement, uh, other than the fact that uh, you had lost faith in words, do you want to elaborate on that? The origin of that piece was uh, a series, of, really, it's a series of pieces, three volumes and a number of prints, was a, um, 
a moment when I was a graduate student. I just entered graduate school as a, 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 in the Department of Philosophy, and my, I had this new, who was new to the department, professor uh, of uh, metaphysics uh, from uh, Germany. Okay. Uh, I thought you were going to say France. <laughs> and, and, and Herr Borgmann basically intimidated me to the point where I was speechless. I was intimidated by his demeanor, his rigor, his uh, that's not, distance. That's his, not being a good teacher. I didn't think he was a good teacher at all, but that's, he's a brilliant man. Okay. And his book is, I like his books. His books are, uh, anyway, let's just say that, that I was coming to a crisis and that he precipitated it. And the crisis that I was coming to might well have been a crisis that was going to happen with or without Albert. But I was, had to turn in a paper, a critique of technology, and I had no critique of technology, and I could not come up with one at that moment in my life. And I was so frustrated, and I, I had, my paper was due the next day. <laughs> and I sat in front of my typewriter, we had typewriters then. I finally gave up, and I mean, in, in sheer exasperation, I just t filled the, the page that was in the typewriter with words, 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 words. And I went off to the, my favorite local tavern and got, promptly got drunk. And, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, I staggered back into, I, well, I walked home. I didn't get that drunk. And someone had uh, let themselves into my house and had gone to my typewriter and had pulled the sheet from it and had laid it down on the desk next to the typewriter and put their hand on the, over the middle of that great block of words and outlined their hand in red pencil. And it was just, you know, that I walked in and there it was. And I, and I looked at that and I thought, that's the critique of technology. I was too drunk to question who had broken into my home. I sort of had an inkling that it might have been this crazy girl that uh, was sort of stalking me. And she was, I mean, certifiably insane. And I said, but it's not a funny thing, it was a sad thing. But she was a, a, a wonderful person, but she was kind of unpredictable. As to her personal space was, uh, you know, was questionable, her, uh, her perception of it. Anyway, she, somebody broke into my house, did that, and I saw the hand superimposed over uh, this machine-like block of words and thought, that's my critique. And... No one had told me I was an artist, that I, that I didn't have the words, but I could create the image. And I, I thought that, that, was, I, that was it. And I, out of exhaustion, I guess, I, I stapled it together with a cover sheet and handed it in. And the next time I saw that professor, he uh, sort of snarled at me that maybe I should find another place to study. He thought you were making fun of him? or Yeah, I think that... Yeah, he, he, I don't know, in his Germanic way, he, he felt that he'd probably, yeah, that he'd been insulted by that paper. And I guess your point is you can only go so far with words. That was the point, yes. I couldn't go there. I just, and I, I didn't feel that they were going to do a damn thing, yeah. you know, as I, and I, which is the foundation of my extraction uh, project that I'm doing now, which is, which is that, I mean, the scientists and the lawyers and the uh, journalists have failed to, cr to, to ameliorate the climate crisis. They've right. utterly failed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm inviting the artists in. I think that the artists have a voice, and I think that the way they say things are, are sometimes so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Words, maybe a few words, but the, the welding together of word and image to me is uh, almost more basic than, than long, detailed analyses. More direct, I guess, you know, but more yeah. of a direct emotional appeal. Yeah, like billboards, you know, really. Yeah. Well, that brings us back to, uh, to Montana, which has been called Montana and, um, and the American West has been called the central mythic narrative of your life, your blood type. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's right. But not so much that as the conquest of indigenous people and the exploitation of the land for economic gain. Yeah, yeah. So that really, that defines your, not your purpose, but what? A, is there a mission that you have that's connected I suppose, to that? 
Yeah, yeah. I think I think that the the fight or the war or the struggle that I'm engaged in is one that is you know, precipitated by the inhumanity of man and or the transhuman neglect. The, the, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, cherishing the, the, the Native American trout. You know, those are the, yeah. some of the most delicate, beautiful creatures on earth. And, you know, they're, you can't even find a native trout anymore. You, we have to rely on these uh, hatchery-produced animals, fish. Yes, I, I've seen the destruction of the world. I, well, mining, I guess, is what Mining and logging and mm-hmm. roading. You know, the eroding or the roading of the wilderness is... I mean, my grandfather created that policy of the roading of the wilderness for the entire nation. Even he regretted it. I mean, in 1935, he wrote a, a, a magnificent essay called The Passing of the Lolo Trail, in which he regretted his own policies of, of, well, of fi- fighting fires, uh, forest fires, and, you know, and great fires. And he created the idea, or didn't create it, but I mean, he was the first to, to write about the idea of just let them burn. You know, this is part of the natural ecological system. No one, no one would accept that. I mean, he was excoriated for having published that paper. Uh, he, today, he's a hero. Uh, his book, his his biography, uh, autobiography, uh, Forty Years of Forester, is now uh, re- re- being revived and reprinted, and he's a hero. There, are high, I, I, one of the, my well, areas of book more environmentally like friendly. What yeah. he's suggested yeah. way back when. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 1935. When the policy was to put every fire out in 30, yet they had what they called a six-hour policy. Okay. If you spot smoke, you have men on it in six hours, and you put it out. And so what did that do? That interrupted a natural cycle? That's right. The, there's a 90-year cycle, burn cycle. And the 90 years is based on the maturity of the lodgepole pine, which is a, a species of pine that is basically the... Uh, largest uh, forest in, in North America uh, and Western North America. And those trees live about 90 years, mature, burn. And when the burn happens, the pine cones open. It takes a burn, it takes a fire to open the pine cone. Uh, so, so if you want to regenerate a forest, forest you yeah. have to burn it. That's interesting. He was involved in forestry and you do a lot of work on paper. Well, I come from a line of those people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, some, some of the earliest work you did was with the Montana Gothic, a small press literary <laughs> magazine. Yeah. And you uh, it featured poetry, Cowboy surre- Surrealist. What What's that all about? Well, I left Montana at the age of 21 and moved to Tangiers. I had inherited a small amount of money and... Uh, uh, or I came into it, uh, it, gov- it was government money. I, I'm a ward of the state and a Democrat because of it. Uh, my father having been killed in yeah. the war. And um, I moved to, t- I went to Paris, Tangiers, and I had lived in the Fiedler house. I thought surrealism was a philosophical art. They had, they had revolution in mind, they had psychiatry in mind, they had they had ideas in mind. They were, they were to me, the most uh, intelligent and adventurous artists that I'd ever encountered to, uh, in the past. So in 71, when I dropped out of college because of my word swords, words, words, words adventure, I went to Paris and sort of hung, I hung out with the Fiedler family, lived with them in their house. They were there on a sabbatical. I'm teaching at the Revolutionary University, Vincennes, you Vincennes, you Vincennes. Anyway, post-68 revolution, I was involved with the lettrist people and, and, and situationists and surrealists. And, and, and when the day came that I was going to start my literary career, you know, for real, I moved to, back to Montana from San Francisco and Berkeley and started this literary journal. But I was brimming with the ideas of, or simmering with the ideas of bringing the surrealist revolution to Montana and, and, to, and, and not so much bringing it to Montana, which is kind of an arrogant way of looking at Montana. I was going to uncover what was there. And so it was sort of an excavation as well. And, and so uh, I was l- looking to uncover the marvelous in Montana. And, and therefore I was uh, uh, collecting a, 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 a disparate group of, of, of crazy artists and poets 
together into a publication, as, as a publication does, right? It's, a, it's mm -hmm. a way of gathering people together, which I like to do. So can, you, uh, can you find these, uh, these magazines online, or uh, can you, could I buy one now, or are they, are they really expensive? Or do you no, know? no. They, they, uh, uh, last time I saw one for sale, it was for six bucks. Whoa, uh, you so know, that'd what, be a fun thing to collect. Oh, then. it would be amazing, yes, and, and uh, good luck. I mean, uh, uh, they're out there because uh, there are certain uh, booksellers that specialize in sort of out outrageous and small press American literature, and anybody like that will have, I'll probably have heard of, of Montana Gothic. And you did it for three or four years, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, and I published the complete Montana Gothic with, with essays, uh, by some of the contributors that are contemporary today. Okay. And so uh, for 30 bucks, you can buy the complete thing in a big fat two and a half but inch thick volume. That's not the original. But it's not the original. Right, yeah. It's just a, it's a, you need it's a, like a Xerox copy. So you must be good with your hands then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So your, your skill then is actually doing the letterpress printing. Is that mm -hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, me, the machine, the paper, the ink, right. That's that's the conversation that goes on. That's the craft that I, I performed. If you take the hands out of it, you can design. But I added that immediately. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as soon as I. But yeah, the craft of printing is is what I what I practiced, and it's in past tense because, of course, today I'm um, more or less retired from the actual physical process, having just you know too many physical ailments to. Uh, it's a brutal. Thing yeah, printing. it's really hard on your back and your oh, really hard arms. on your back and standing on your you know yeah. your legs and yeah. I, I can't do it. But anymore. hard on your ears too, right? Oh yeah, I lost my hearing. Yeah, that's a kind of yeah with the power presses and the, that and the and the country music played at full volume <laughs> over the top of the Heidelberg <laughs> running, you know, so that I can hear the music because right. I'm there all day long, day after day after day. After so you didn't day. have to go to concerts to ruin your ears. You no, just, I did uh, not. No, <laughs> no, I didn't. So what, what part of it then do you enjoy doing the most? Well, today or then? In your life? Well, I think the part that I, I liked the most was, was the, well, first of all, the, uh, uh, coming up with the idea mm. was exciting. So that when I knew that I had a vision and I could see it, the minute I could see it, I knew I could make it. Because I, like, I, like you mentioned, I'm good with my hands. I, if I saw it, I could do it. I had to see it first. In your mind's eye. In my mind's eye. Yeah. And so that was a thrill. The practice of printing itself, I suppose it is the achieving of the near perfect page and then the sort of the first 50 impressions. You know, oh my God, it's happening again. It's, oh, it's still happening, you know, on impression two. Oh, it's still happening, impression three. Mm -hmm. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it together. Yeah. This is... This is, uh, this is... You're in the zone. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the zone. I made it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, take a deep breath. I can, now I can print, yeah. you know, and then it becomes mechanical. And then it becomes this thing that you... Then it becomes a, 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 a Buddhist mantra or a yogic exercise. You know, how do, how do you keep your mind focused and uh, on it and, and uh, you know, and not drive yourself crazy? So you've mentioned a couple people who've, who achieved this perfection. Uh, any others to, to come to mind who you really, mm -hmm. really admire? Well, there's, there's a combination. Yeah, there are others. I, I admire the work of the Grabhorn Press. Mm. Uh, they were uh, tremendous, I mean, or the Pressman anyway. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and, the, and John Henry Nash had a Pressman who was superb. Uh, I even used to know his name, but at the moment I can't recall it. And today, Russell Merritt is one of the finest printers alive. I mean, he's, there's no doubt about it. He's, he's carried uh, it to heights that even I <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> dare aspire to. Wow. Seriously. No, wow. seriously. Russell is uh, an amazing craftsman. Absolutely wow. amazing. As a printer, as a thinker as well, but as a printer, he's, he's, he's unsurpassed. Uh, so it's still being, it's still going on today, and there are others that I could name, but I mean, it's a, in fact, the list is fairly long. There's a level of perfection that you reach as a craftsman in which you know that you've mastered it, and that's enough. I then think, you do go crazy, I guess, trying to replicate that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that many printers have achieved that.
I mean, okay. I mean, I would add into that. I mean, seriously. I mean, people like uh, Jason Denowitz, who in more remote Canada, uh, 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 young man whose work is. I mean, he's achieved perfection in his printing, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Hamity achieved perfection in his printing, no doubt about it, etc. I could name more. Uh, um, well, enough is enough. Yeah. You're coming toward the end of your life. I am. Yeah, that has that's well. That's due to this cancer, myeloma, my multiple myeloma that I, I'm in the middle of. It's a incurable cancer, but it's treatable. The doctors will say, "Well, no promises," but I have patients that have had it for ten, twenty years. But they probably also have patients that have had it for five and four. So they don't tell you about that. They tell you about the ones that have lived. A long time, and they're very proud of. So, and they don't know, and it's it's a mystery. Yeah, I think there's so many uh, there's so many mysteries still to mm -hmm. to understand. Yeah, and I'm 76 years. Well, will be 76 years old in just a few weeks here. You know, that's a, that's a that's a that's a ripe old age. I've come to discover looking in the mirror. <laughs> 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 so, what else have you discovered looking in the mirror about your career and you know, what you've done with your life and, the, and that sort of thing? Oh. Well, I discovered that I was fortunate. That's one thing that I'm grateful for. The amazing people that I've met, the good fortune I had to be born into, the family that I was born into. And Would you say that's part of the trajectory of your life or what's driven it is to connect with people in the book well, world yeah, that yeah. you admire? I just feel comfortable amongst them. Yeah, yeah, I like to learn from them, but I also like, I like the brilliance of conversation. Yeah. And, but I don't know, I just feel that that's my natural place. I, because they love what you love. Yep, yep. And I am a social animal. Uh, you know, going to the wilderness for me was always a quick adventure. Overnight, two or three days. A week at the most. Solitude and I, over a long period of time, we're not comfortable together. I mean, I like my solitude because that's where I get my work done. You know, I don't mind going to the studio and being all alone there because that's where I'm working and that's where I'm making order out of chaos. Uh, but uh, I like a, I like a, a meal uh, in company, and I, I, I like a martini if I can have one. And there's nothing better than a martini a martini in company. I don't <laughs> like solitary drinking. So. No, thanks very much for congregating with me. Yeah. For telling me about your life and your work. It's really a pleasure. Peter Koch has been designing and printing limited edition books, portfolios, and ephemera since 1974. He has long been recognized as one of the most accomplished printers and typographic designers of his generation.